All right. Okay, I'm back again with the soldering. We're gonna break these up into like just shorter videos because I know sitting and watching long videos, you can kind of fall asleep, especially if you're on your couch. Um, so we're gonna do each video and then stop. And then you can then find the one that says sweat soldering or and go back and review them. But the first one we're gonna do today is our butt joint. And what I need to look at is I need to look at my metal, the size of it, so my copper is a little bit bigger than my brass. So it's the area of the metal, but it's also the thickness. And when I look at this, I can see that my copper is a little bit thicker. So probably not too much to worry about, but when you do get varying thicknesses, you do run into problems soldering. So the problems that you're gonna run into with, and this is something that you'll wanna remind yourself about, solder goes wherever it's the hottest, right? So if you have a really small piece and you have a really big piece and you heat them up evenly, the solder is going to run to the smaller piece. Okay? So size matters here with soldering. And then also um, the type of metals. And so I, I categorize them, the non-ferrous metals into two groups, the ones that conduct heat really well and the ones that don't conduct heat. And so the ones that conduct heat really well are gold, silver, and copper and they heat up really well. That's why our electrical wire is copper. That's why we don't use aluminum anymore because aluminum isn't as conductive. Um, and then we have the ones that are not as conductive and those are brass, bronze, and nickel. So if you first of all segregate those out and say, this one's gonna heat up faster, this is gonna heat up slower, this one's bigger, so it's gonna need more heat. You really wanna logically think when you set up to solder what you're doing. So when I'm looking at this here, I know that my copper's a little bit bigger, but I also know that my copper heats up faster. So I'm probably gonna be able to evenly heat both sides and get my solder to flow because the solder, when it starts to melt, is gonna go where it's the hottest. And if the joint where the two meet is the hottest, the solder's gonna run down that. One of the things I learned really early on is when you're heating the piece, you can actually see the solder chip march to one side, the solder before it even melts starts to gravitate towards where it's the hottest. So that's a warning sign to get over and heat the other side. And that may happen while I'm soldering. Um, so I wanna talk again about cleaning up. I'm gonna take my Scotch-Brite pad and I'm gonna find my smooth straight edge. And if you're one of those people like I was in school, it's like, what do you mean it doesn't solder gaps? You can try soldering something that doesn't fit well together and you can see the end results yourself. But I've got these cleaned up. I've done this on the table here, not on my fireboard. And now I'm gonna come over and the three things I think about when I solder is the type of metal, the size of the metal, and my setup. Because each one of these solder samples is gonna have a different setup. When I do a butt joint, I do it laying down on the Maronite board so that it's nice and flat. If I set it on a fire brick that's irregular, it might not line up very well. So I like to do my butt joints right down on the fire board. Okay, so I've thought about the sizes, I've thought about the types of metal, and I've thought about what setup I need to have success here. The next thing I'm gonna do is take my flux Make sure that it's a consistency of yogurt. And mine's a little thin, so it's not Greek yogurt, but Greek yogurt is really about the consistency that you want. I'm gonna take my poor old paintbrush. I think I need a new one for the school year. And I'm gonna paint both sides. And I'm just gonna paint where the solder joint's gonna be. So when you're working with silver, you might want to cover it completely. But when we're learning to solder, I want you guys to see what the flux does. And the oxides are gonna build up where there isn't the flux. And I wanna just make sure that there's just a nice even strip there. Okay, so that's set up. I'm gonna take my medium solder and I'm gonna scrub my solder clean also. Um, I know some people don't worry about it, but I like to just get a little if there's any oxides on there. And then something about scissors, they cut best way back here. They don't cut as well. If I'm trying to cut out here, nothing's gonna happen. But if I come in 
right into the crotch of that and I cut it, I can get a nice long little straight piece cut. And I'm cutting them about a thick sixteenth of an inch. And then I'm going to come along and you notice that I'm cutting them and catching them in my finger. Because otherwise if I do that, it'll end up over here. But I also had a student push their finger in so far they cut themselves. So all you're doing is catching it when it falls off that's there. They do make um, pliers that cut um, solder chips for you and everything. These are here and they're kind of nice. Um, I'm one of those people where I don't want somebody not to make jewelry because they can't afford all the fancy tools. So, but this will come in and it'll just nip it for you. And then it falls down in. It also has, oh, this one doesn't. A lot of them also have a place where you can stick your wire in and cut the same length. It, has one. it does? Mine does that one. Oh, yours does. This one doesn't. This one's made in Pakistan. And Pakistan has amazing metal smiths there. They just probably weren't asked to put a hole in it too. So, okay. But like I said, talk to me because there are other fancier tools. I just like to keep it as simple so that you feel like you're not overwhelmed, that you can't be a jeweler because you're going to need $20,000 to do it. Okay. So I've got my solder chips. You can see the size of them. Um, it takes a while to learn to know how much solder to use. So what I would like you to do is kind of imitate me because that's how we learn. Even little kids learn that way. Pick pieces of metal that are the same size and the solder chips that are the same size. I'm going to come in and I'm going to put a little bit of flux on my solder chips. And then I'm going to take my little tweezers and I'm going to pick up my solder chip. Am I holding it long enough? Yep. Okay. And then I'm going to come over and I'm going to lay them on top of the solder joint. Okay. So you don't want it in between because that would be a gap. You want it to sit on top and because the metal conducts heat, the solder will transfer through the thickness. And you notice that I laid one at each end of the solder joint. When the solder flows, it's very liquid. And so it has a tendency to pull in and that's called capillary action. Yes, we do have science here. Um, so I like to, it's a good rule to put a solder joint at each end of the solder joint so that you know the solder gets all the way out. And then I space this about, oh, about a half inch apart. And I'm doing that because I know the thickness of my metal and I know how far it needs to travel. And I bet if I wanted to, I could take the one out in the center and we still might get a solder joint, but I'm gonna kinda be safe and make sure that it all flows the first time. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna light my torch. And remember we did a video on that for annealing, but my gas is on. I'm gonna open up my gas. I'm gonna get a little bit of air added to it after I get it about four or five inches. And I'm gonna slowly add my air to a nice neutral flame. Come on. There you go. So when you see that yellow, that's a dirty flame. When you see just a nice blue cone, that's a neutral flame. When you see it hissing like this, you've got an oxidizing flame. That's going to oxidize your metal. It's going to blow away your flux and then you're not going to have any luck. So while you're soldering, I want you to be paying attention to your tip. Okay. So half inch, five eighths. I'm gonna come straight down from the top because if I heat like this, I don't know where it's the hottest, but if I come straight down, I know where it's the hottest. And these torches do fluctuate a little bit. I'm gonna come down perpendicular and I'm gonna heat the outside because the metal is gonna transfer heat. And if I just go right into the joint, it's gonna send the heat away and then the solder is gonna run that way. Do you notice that the flux is turned white on both pieces? That's the first thing you want to be looking for is, is those are the same temperature because the flux turns white at 300 degrees. I'm going to come in and keep heating. So I think of my torch as being a paintbrush and that I'm going to paint the whole surface, but I'm going to start out on the edges first 
and you can see that the solder is staying in place but can you see that the flux is turning clear more on the brass than the, the copper that might be the thickness now the flux has gone clear so that's the time i want to target the joint with my torch tip and i want to work up and down and what's going to happen is the solder is going to beat up and then it's going to get to the point where it flows so there's a melting point and there's a flow point and do you notice that i'm kind of leaning a little bit more to the copper piece and oh it's my lucky day and now i'm going to flip it over for two reasons i don't want it to stick to the board but i also want to make sure that this solder went all the way through so you can turn it back over and you can heat it up and you can see the solder reflow again and there it goes so solder is not like welding where once you get the weld joint it's, it's cast in place solder actually can reflow and I still remember when I learned that I could take something apart that I didn't put on right. It was magic. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to drop it into the water. I'm not going to hold on to it with my tweezers because the piece might crack. I'm going to pull it out. I just brought myself a new towel for the quarter. And it happens to be Santa. Because Santa. we'll be ending the quarter around Christmas time, Hanukkah time, the new year. Woohoo! So when you look at this, I think you can see that the flux, it did start to burn away, but you can see that it kept all these oxides off. And this is where the solder is. So it's not quite as clean a line as on the back. So sometimes I'll solder from the back if I have a beautiful pattern on the front of my piece. So um, for cleanup. But I'll be showing you guys how to clean up the excess solder on here and making the line just hairline. And then the other thing you should notice and you should try is to bend it and it shouldn't break. And then I can bend it back. And if I keep doing that, eventually something's gonna give. And usually it's not the solder joint, it's usually the metal that's right next to the solder joint. But that's kind of the magic of silver soldering. And it takes a while to learn how to silver solder, just like it takes a while to learn how to do any of the techniques. The more you come in and practice, the better you're gonna get. So remember the three things, three things, remember? You need to know what the type of metals we're working with and how they conduct heat. We need to know about the size because that's gonna make a difference in the heating. And we need to know which is the right setup for soldering. And so anything that you're doing that's a butt joint, you'll want to do flat on the surface here. And remember to have your metal clean, flexed, and solder chips at both ends. All right, good luck.